Now, folks, if you'll just gather around a little closer now. Come right in a little closer. That's it. That's fine. That's fine, folks. You say what you like, as long as you can take the pressure. Yeah? As long as you realize that Antonio Tarver's narrative will not hold up whether Tyson Fury beats Usyk or he loses against Usyk. It will be all dependent on what Anthony Joshua does. If for the second time in a row he disposes of a former Tyson Fury opponent in a more convincing manner than Fury did, the inevitable calls for the biggest, most lucrative showdown in British boxing history will be overwhelming. And all of you following the Tarver narrative that if Fury beats Usyk, the AJ fight is not necessary, may I remind you that Tarver doesn't live in the United Kingdom. And he's not the Tyson Fury fan that some of you are. Now I respect Antonio Tarver as a fighter. I think I've got an interview with him somewhere. But he doesn't know what domestic clashes mean to the domestic scene. He, he doesn't relate to how it will affect Fury's resume. In British media, in British press, amongst British sporting fans. He doesn't understand. Now you're going to say that the fight's irrelevant. But you're going to get bent out of shape... You're going to get all in your feelings when certain fans, and they're not all going to be Anthony Joshua fans, when certain sectors of the media start screaming for that fight. Fury won't be able to take the pressure. John Fury won't be able to take the pressure. And you, Mr. Tyson Fury fan, will not be able to take the pressure. You're going to be screaming that you hate Eddie Hearn, you don't like Joshua, you don't like this, you don't like that. You knew what was coming. And Antonio Tava will not be able to save you. Fury's for one cruiserweight, Steve Cunningham, who had him on the canvas. AJ lost twice to Usek, former undisputed cruiserweight champion. Usek is a unified, undisputed cruiserweight champion. Tyson Fury is an undisputed nothing that could change on the 17th. But if Usek loses, he could say that he did become undisputed in one weight class. He did do that. If he beats Fury, he becomes a two-weight undisputed champion. Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua will never be multiple weight champions. This is the advantage Usyk has in his resume over the two men. He's doing something that the vast majority of cruiserweights couldn't do, which makes him unique. It's more impressive jumping up from cruiser to heavy and winning world titles than it is from light middle to middle, from light welter to welter, from minimum weight to junior fly. It is what it is. Career heavyweights cannot be multiple weight champions. To build their legacy, they have to take on all comers. They have to try and clear out their division. That's what they have to do. 25 defenses like Joe Lewis. And I'm talking about successful title defenses. 20 for Larry Holmes. 18 for Klitschko in his last reign. 5 in his first reign. Muhammad Dali. You go to the Ring Magazine rankings in the 70s at various periods and he's cleaned out the whole division. He's fought everybody there and beat everybody in the rankings. Mike Tyson, similar job. You go to the Ring Magazine rankings in the 80s when he was reigning. And Tyson's fought everybody, literally. Everybody. Can you say the same for Tyson Fury? How can you ignore fighting the guy who brought the life back to the sport, the money back into the sport? The guy who's made more mandatory defenses than Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. And just think he's going to go away and not be questioned if you don't fight the guy. Well, I think it really splits people down the middle, Eddie. Because like, Conor Baird essentially, I assume, could come back, serve a backdated ban. Yeah, because he yeah. hasn't fought in the UK that long. But then that is essentially him admitting fault. you know. Yeah. But he doesn't want to do that. Uh, and the board won't relent on it either. No one has all the facts, so it's impossible mm. to, to take a side. Ideally, we can figure out something. We can see Ben back in the UK and preferably in a, in a massive fight because it's a big name with an interesting personality and a very exciting fighting style. So he's missed here in the UK while he's not fighting. Conor Ben has lost a lot of momentum. 2021 blasted out Samuel Vargas, a very durable, tough fighter. Nobody did what Conor did to him as quick. Adrian Granadas, he picked up the track shoes, scared to get hit by Connor. He went the distance. Chris Algieri got blown out. 2021, 
was a good year, you know, like um, he looked like a different fighter from the guy who had the war with Cedric Pernod. 2022, he picked up where he left off from the Chris Algieri fight and flattened Van Heerden in two. Then late 2022, awaiting the big showdown against Chris Eubank Jr. and Connor Potts for clofamine. Now, the media definitely overreacted. You have to wonder if their vitriol was more against Eddie Hearn than Connor. And he got a lot of headlines, negative headlines. You know what I mean? Like they couldn't keep his name off their video titles, talk sport. They couldn't keep him off there and other outlets. But now he's back in the ring, you know, like he had a fight last year against Orozco. His first fight, 17 months after the Van Heerden knockout in America, hidden away. And now he's in Las Vegas fighting Peter Dobson from the Bronx, 16 and 09 inside the distance, 33 years of age. He's almost become the forgotten man. You know what I mean? Like, all of a sudden, so much momentum lost. He needs an explosive win tomorrow because his fight will be overshadowed by the South London light heavyweight battle between Aziz and Boatsy. Well, first he needs to take care of business on Saturday. That's number one. And then get his issues with the board and UCAD resolved and get his career in the UK back on track. He's supposed to be one of our biggest stars. His opponent looks a lot bigger than him, but I don't know what that's saying. I haven't seen Peter Dobson before and I haven't done a scouting report. I just haven't had the time. But I will be watching on Saturday. Unfortunately, Connor fights on the zone and he's fighting to accommodate the British time zone, which is the same time zone that Boatsy and Aziz will be on in London. The Ovo. So there's a little bit of a clash there, but you know, I'll be watching Connor. Let's hope he can get back on track on Saturday with a big knockout, get his issues sorted out. He has to get that momentum back. They've been going back and forth. Dobson said, I hope you know I ain't one of them dudes on your built-up record. I hope you train hard. Ben, I know they, meaning his previous opponents, message you to talk shit. Dobson, you talk so proper and nice, you sound like a nice guy. Ben, I am a nice guy, actually. I'm actually a lovely guy, to be honest with you. Your lips twitching. Stop twitching, bro. Stop shaking. You're fucking shaking. Stop shaking. You fucking pussy. Dobson, Dobson replies, your pussy. Dobson said he's shaking because he wants to fight. Ben, you're shaking because you're scared. Dobson, you pussy, you're a short midget. You look like a little rich pretty boy. I'm going to fuck your face up. Ben says, I am a rich pretty boy. My fighting speaks for itself. Yours don't. Dobson, my fighting speaks for itself. You've got a padded record. You know what type of fight you're in? You're in with a dude from the mud. I hope you're prepared. Ben, if I do what I wanted to do right now, I'd be arrested and there'd be no fight. Dobson, a scared man is a dangerous man. Ben, he said, you admitted you're scared. Dobson, all you do is throw hard shots. You're athletic with fast hands, fast feet. That's it. Well, they both be talking shit, so not too long to go. I've seen them hands fly on Saturday. Joshua Boatsy, 30 years of age, 17 wins, 13 inside the distance, no reverses, no draws. Dan Aziz, 20 wins, 13 inside the distance, no losses, no draws. 34 years of age. The last time Boatsy fought three times in a year, and bear in mind he's not at world title level. This is something to consider for me in how this fight plays out. 2019 was the last time he fought three times in a year. Dan Aziz fought three times in 2022 and he's fought nine times since 2019, as opposed to Boatsy's five times since 2019. In the gloves are rough. Dan Aziz was correct when he observed that a loss, in theory, hurts Joshua Boatsy worse because he's been touted to be a world champion since 2016 when he got a bronze medal at the Olympics, signed up with 258 Management and Matram. Dan Aziz has become British, Commonwealth and European champion with no fanfare. Just a couple of years back, hooked up with Lee Eaton and MTK Global, the manager and boxer were hoping that they could get something more permanent on Matram, on Sky, Frank Warren, to take some of the financial burden away from Dan preparing to climb up the 175 pound rankings and they got that with Boxer. I don't know if it's a fixed 
contract for a select number of fights, but they have a working relationship that Dan seems happy with. And Bawatsi was trying to push it off like, oh, no, it would be bad for both of us. That's a 50-50 fight. It's not a 50-50 fight, according to the bookmakers. Joshua Bawatsi, despite them having the same amount of KOs, Bawatsi has achieved his 30 knockouts in less fights than Aziz. And on the eye test, I think it would be fair to say he hits harder. He's bigger. Longer reach. Olympic pedigree. Some people have compared Boatsy to Evander Holyfield. I don't know about that. I'd have to look into it more and try and understand where these people are coming from when they say that. But yeah, he is the favourite. And for Boatsy to try and pass it off like, yes, the loss will have the same impact on both of us when he's the favourite. And Dan Aziz was saying he doesn't want to accept the pressure. He doesn't want to take the pressure. He doesn't want to say what it is, really. And he was onto something there. Dan Aziz believes that Bawatsi picked him because it's an easier touch, perhaps, than taking on Bivol, who he could have fought before their fight got cancelled last year. And he hooked up with Ben Shalom and Boxer. He could have fought Bivol on Matrim. And Dan believes that he's cherry-picking him. Of course, Bawatsi denied that. And Dan, you know, he observed that, yeah, you're taking this because you think it's an easier touch. And Dan said he's taking it because it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I'm guessing it's something between boxers. Sometimes I, I don't understand why boxers try and pass off that kind of pressure onto the other to get an advantage. I, I don't know what that's about. If you're favorite, you're favorite. If you're underdog, you're underdog. It's all about how you prepare and how you feel about yourself. Not what the bookmakers say, surely. Not what the media say, not what I say. Now, Virgil... My observations on Virgil training Boatsy. He's trying to get Joshua not to overextend over his feet and get his balance better and be mindful of what's coming back at him and then bring his counters. I think I think Boatsy's struggling with that style a little. But they've been together three years or so, or maybe even longer. About three years. And by now. The partnership should be reaping rewards, but it's hard to tell, like, the inactivity is not a good thing. And this is where Dan Aziz can bridge the gap. He now trains with Buddy McGurk. They'll want to take that jab away and make Boatsy work at a pace that perhaps he's uncomfortable with. I've seen Boatsy throw a lot of shots and blow the engine out a little and have to get a second wind. Dan doesn't throw power punches like Boatsy, so it doesn't take as much out of him. And he seems to have a bit of work rate. And the inactivity for Boatsy could play a part, could play a part. But I'm going to pick Boatsy to win a close decision, a split, or maybe a UD. I'm not willing to go against the favourite, although Dan has made inroads into the domestic scene very well, winning British, Commonwealth and European, and taking some good scalps. I think it would be competitive, but Boatsy should win this. He should win this. I haven't seen no fragility in Dan Aziz's chin, his punch resistance doesn't look suspect. His gas tank looks okay. His conditioning looks good. But Watsi, to me, he has to kind of like go out there and look a little like Jaime did it on Saturday against John Ryder. You know, using that jab, doubling it up, tripling it up, shooting that right hand quick, using the fundamentals that Virgil is trying to teach him, but not lose his identity either. Be more instinctive. The whole notion that a boxer is going to retire or threaten to retire. Because he's not going to retire. But to make a big deal about a sanctioning body decision to nominate two boxers to fight for a title. And that's going to make you throw a hissy fit. is ridiculous. Like, Shakur is too focused on sanctioning bodies and on unnecessary things. Kind of like Teofimo Lopez. You know, he's got a difficult fight with Jermaine Ortiz coming up. And he's talking about Matram and Eddie Hearn setting him up for the Cambosos fight. You know, Cambosos is not even signed with Matram. He's not even signed with the zone. Eddie won the purse bid and that's it. And if you can't see that, you've got serious issues. But, you know, back to Shakur. If they nominate Navarrete to fight Baranchik at 135, it is what it is. It's sanctioning body politics. Shakur needs to work on his ring performances because a lot of people weren't pleased with the DeSantos performance in November. There was talk of him rematching DeSantos because at first he said, I ain't going to make no excuses, no excuses. And then 
he says his left hand was injured and this was injured and that was injured. There was a few injuries after saying no excuses. I mean, he's still got a belt, a WBC belt. How about focus on that and not what some old dudes are doing in some sanctioning body office somewhere? Why are you worried about that? Show us that the DeSantos fight was down to the injury and let's see the star quality. How about that? Now, he's probably thinking he should be fighting for one of them vacant belts. But the thing is, Navarrete is a top rank fighter. I don't know what Baranchik's situation is, but Navarrete is top rank. So if he wins, Shakur will be in line to fight him. But Shakur can't be expected to manipulate the board with performances like the last one. He can't be expecting everything to fall in his lap. You've got to go out there and show star quality. That's the bottom line. That's Shakur's job. Not trying to shame sanctioning bodies to accommodate him. Got to grow up. You know, in America, they're still talking about Devin Haney sparring rumours. We heard that story about five, six years ago. That Tank tagged him, but Devin came back and outboxed him. You know I mean? Who cares? You know, Broner seems desperate to spread that story. Talking about he wants to fight Haney. Nobody wants to see Adrian Broner fight Devin Haney and jump over a plethora of better contenders. Stop. What was it the other day? Somebody was talking about Erickson Lubin stole Devin Haney's sneakers years back. Now, Wooly Willie got a pair of my sneakers. Wonder where he got them because I hit him behind my speakers. Is this the juvenile shit that's going on? Is that supposed to impress somebody and stop me watching a Devin Haney fight? Talk about everything rather than whooping someone's ass in the ring. Broner had opportunities. He had opportunities. Erickson Lubin had opportunities. How come he didn't fight Tim Zhu? Although, in all truth, is he really a better option than Keith Thurman? I, I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> well, the funniest one recently is Britain's Liam Davis. I've seen it posted up a few times. The first time I thought it was a joke. Liam Davis versus Na Anue. Huh? What? Against who? Huh? What? Liam Davis against Anue. And who? So don't know. Has the fire in my belly? I want to prove, like, that this weight, 122, I'm, I can be the man. I feel like I'm different to everyone. And uh, if I can't beat Robles, there's no point me standing here saying, give me a shot at Nui, because I've got, I've got no chance, have I? So. Man trying to get man killed out there. Is he qualified for that fight? He's got an unbeaten record, so I guess he's as qualified as anybody to try his luck. Has Frank Warren given up on the Dennis McCann fight? I thought he was supposed to fight Dennis McCann. I was looking forward to that. I take it back. He is European and British champion, Liam, so why not? He takes on Eric Robles Ayala for the IBO World Super Bantamweight title in Birmingham. Yeah, it looks a bit more winnable, Liam. <laughs> Gotta keep it real. I just love it, man. I love, I love everything about this. I love the stage. I love the action. Main event, unfortunately, the title will not be on the line, but his pride will be, and that's good enough for me. Any response, Tim? You bring that energy, man. I want that energy coming into the fight because uh, when I do, and mark my words, I will knock you out in under 12 rounds. You can try, my man. You can try, but you're going to get more than energy. You're going to get these hands, baby, all up in your you're gonna, face. You're going to be running. You're going to be running, and I'm going to be catching you like a little gazelle. Your fat feet slow. Uh, man, look, in Australia, you that's see? a small little, that's an island very far away. I did not know flat-footed Mexicans were born in Australia, zoo. <laughs> you Mexican you zoo, what you going to do? Sound like old dirty bastard without the rap skills, man. <laughs> like, I think Keith actually is enjoying himself, or maybe Al Haim put him up to this to try and sell the fight. You know, Keith tries to meet his wacky dude, like he tried it with Pacquiao. I remember, big, big, big Pacquiao with his T Rex arms. And then Pacquiao whooped his ass. <laughs> it is what they're bringing to Amazon Prime. How about you make some proper fights? And the flat-footed Mexican stereotype is not going to go down very well with the Mexican demographic. 
I did not know flat-footed Mexicans were born in Australia, zoo.